Welcome, everyone, to our first lecture of the semester. Um, I'm breaking these lectures into a few parts, and so this is part one of three of what came before. Let's get into it. Okay, the first thing I want to show you is the timeline for the entire class. And as you can see, at the beginning of the timeline, from about 1600 to 1720-ish, we just have one art movement. And then in the 1700s, we get a couple more. And then in the 1800s, they do start to stack up. And then right around the turn of the century in the 1900s, we get about 10 to 12. So the beginning, we're just going to be studying one art movement, but in different geographical locations. Um, and as we move on, we will look at different art movements and how they are reactions to each other. We're going to start with the Baroque, which happens around 1600, and eventually we'll make our way all the way to Cubism and Dadaism. In order to talk about the Baroque, we need to discuss the art that came before, and we need to go back a couple hundred years, maybe even a thousand years, to sort of get to the heart of why the Baroque art looks the way it does. Because, as I will continuously hammer home, hopefully in this class, context matters. Historical context and art historical context. In order to understand the way art looks, or the way the entire period sort of embraces ideas, we need to see the context from which they are coming. And today we're going to discuss a few different art movements that absolutely reflected what it is the Baroque art became. So we're going to talk about a few things. Characteristics of medieval art, uh, Renaissance art, Mannerist art, and we're going to talk about a very um, significant historical event called the Reformation. Uh, we'll cover this more in the next lecture as well, the Reformation. And I'm probably going to talk about the Reformation all the way until the end of the semester. So it would behoove you to learn about the Reformation early on. All right, let's begin with medieval art, which basically is just European art um, from about the time of 800 to 1400. I'm going to go with CE in this class, keep it secular, even though we're going to talk about a lot of uh, religious subjects. Uh, let's keep the time frame secular. So CE means common era, of course, um, instead of AD, which is the religious time frame. In medieval art, it was mostly religious. Um, as you can see, that's Notre Dame. They emphasized emotion, spirituality. Artists were mostly self-taught. There was a whole training process of apprentice work. There were anonymous craftsmen. You didn't have names like, you know, Michelangelo or Caravaggio or Picasso. We really don't know who all the artists were. We have a few names, like the architect of some cathedrals in Paris is Abbot Suger. But for the most part, we don't really know who designed things, who sculpted things, who crafted things. It was a joint effort, and it was an anonymous effort, and it was to reflect religiosity. I'm doing this not for my own self-worth, but to honor uh, God above. The kinds of art they produced were mosaics, which are basically artworks made from little tiny stones called tesserae or glass. Illuminated manuscripts, which were books that they copied, and mostly the books they copied were Bibles or stories of saints. There were, of course, copies of pagan authors. There were also churches and cathedrals, and in those cathedrals there was relief carving which basically means sculpture that was carved out of a wall where you couldn't actually walk around it and there was reliquary decoration which basically means like this is the box that holds the crown of thorns or true piece of the cross of Christ or the bones of the finger of Saint John the Baptist so they made pretty boxes for those. One thing you should know is that the reason um, that all art was based and centralized around the church is because life was horrific for many people. It was chaotic, and the church provided this sense of continuity and consistency. And so it didn't matter if the statues looked exactly like who the bishop was at the time or what the king looked like. There were just symbols that said, this is a king, and hey, you have a king, um, so things are going to be okay. It was kind of like Egyptian art. A pharaoh from the first dynasty in the artwork looks very similar to a pharaoh from the 30th dynasty 
3,000 years later. Why this consistency is the question. Basically, the idea is that life is hard and we need some reassurance uh, that we're going to be okay. And the church provided that not only through art, but sometimes the church was the only place where you would get consistent food, like some wine and some bread. And the church played a central role in everybody's lives. There's, it's, it's hard to think about it now because our lives are busy and it revolves around work and school and the internet. But at the time, it was just like you farmed and you went to church. And so the art that most people saw reflected this idea of this is the main thing in your life and you need to venerate it, worship it, um, and make it a part of your life. So some characteristics of medieval art are almond-shaped eyes, uh, flat figures. In the churches, you have those Gothic arches, which are pointed arches. They serve a decorative purpose as well as an architectural uh, purpose because they held up the top of those tall roofs. Here's a few examples of medieval art. And this is not to say that you couldn't recognize that that's a dead king and queen or that those aren't flowers in the margins of that book. The point is, realism wasn't important. Just the fact that you could recognize these things was more important. A lot of the figures looked two-dimensional, cartoonish, stiff, um, and, and that's because they weren't trying to depict um, exactly what people look like. What they were trying to do was get the point across. Here are angels. Uh, here is a saint. Pray to that saint uh, to find your lost child. They didn't have academies. They didn't have art instructors. If you were a sculptor, you learned to sculpt from the person that was sculpting before. There were some beautiful sculptures that were made. We don't know the name of the monk who illuminated that manuscript and that dusty, drafty monastery, but we do see the work of that monk. We don't know the architect who built that cathedral, but we do know that that cathedral is meant to be a house of worship. Why are we doing this? Why are we looking at art from 800 years before the period we're supposed to study? The point is, um, the art that we're going to study is also religious in nature. However, that art is a reaction to something that happened, which upended the Catholic Church. This is to point out that there was no other option. It was just the Catholic Church, or at the time it was known as the Christian Church. This is what religious art looked like for a very long time. And we'll see why the art changed during the Baroque. Before we get to the Baroque, we have to talk about uh, a few art movements that followed this medieval period, and how it changed from anonymity to now there are superstars in the art world. And now there are academies where artists study so something happened in Europe in the 1300s and the 1400s. Um, one of the biggest things was the Black Plague, or the Black Death, or the Plague, whatever you want to call it. And it wiped out a huge amount of the population, like 60% of the people. This allowed for a lot of social mobility, because now if you were just a peasant who was working the land, a serf, with a, working the land for a lord. The lord dies, everybody in the lord's family dies, everybody in the power structure dies, and you're one of the few remaining people in the town. You all of a sudden have a, a role in that town that is greater. And so after the, the Black Death, or the plague sweeps through Europe, and it happens a few times. It doesn't just happen once. It, it goes through a, a region, seems to die off, and then it comes back, and it goes into the 1500s and 1600s. Plague returns again and again. Um, it's just that those first bouts with the plague really just destroyed entire towns and cities and killed a lot of people. So what I'm saying is there was opportunity. Uh, opportunity to distinguish yourself like there wasn't before. And there was probably a little bit less faith in Christianity than there was before as well. And so the, there are other reasons, of course. There was increased trade. The Silk Road had come about, and that meant that there was trade with the Far East, the Middle East. Um, probably one of the reasons that the, the plague happened, because there was an exchange of 
viruses and bacteria that had never happened before. There were the Crusades in which Christian warriors went to the Middle East or Jerusalem or Byzantium, and they brought back goods and books. Uh, and those books were also important because those books were basically texts from you know, Greek or Roman philosophers or math books from Arabic scholars. The numbers that we use, uh, they were using Roman numerals for a long time, and then they found the Arabic numerals, and that allowed for greater bookkeeping possibilities, which is how the Medicis and Florence became rich. They changed their bookkeeping style. And so I guess what I'm saying is there was like this really sort of wonderful soup that was kind of swirling around in Europe at the time. Uh, and all of those things, the opportunity, the, the new ideas, gave this period um, this idea that things were going to get better. And Renaissance basically means rebirth, which is saying we're things are going to go back to when it was best. And when was it best? Ancient Greece and Rome. So the, the Renaissance is referring to uh, the classical ideals of Greece and Rome. So artists, what they did was they engaged in this thing called Neoplatonism, which basically just means combining Greek philosophical ideas with Christian Bible stories. And uh, they took a more scientific approach to creating things. They were trying to understand like what things really look like as opposed to in the Middle Ages when it was just like, this is good enough. For the Renaissance artists, it wasn't good enough. They really wanted to sort of nail down reality. Now you have individual artists. You have a system of patrons beyond the church. Uh, before, during the Middle Ages, the only person that was going to pay you to make something as an artist or an artisan or an architect uh, was the church. But now you have all of these competing families throughout Europe that are trying to outdo each other. And one of the ways to do that is to get the best artists. So who are those artists and what did they do that was so revolutionary? That's part two.